Chairman of MMC 2013. And uh, um, this session is about media delivery and the catching. And uh, we have three very interesting talks uh, in, in, in this session. The first session, uh, the first paper is about um, the production and delivery and the rendering of immersive media. And it will be presented by o o uh, Omar Niamat. Uh, he is currently a research scientist at TNO from Um OK, please. How's this? Better? Much. Much better. Okay. Good. I'm not going to repeat myself. A lot of people uh, that authored this paper. So, um, this, is, this work is about a system that we've been working on uh, uh, for a couple of years now, and I guess it's, uh, we have some very nice uh, uh, results that I would like to share with you. Uh, what I would also like to say that uh, these days I've seen a lot of interesting uh, toppings combined. It's a very nice community, and I think, for example, the last paper shows how crucial these topics say, uh, are to, uh, to our world. Uh, for example, the latency and voice conversation, uh, obviously it's something that can lead to disastrous uh, results. So enough about that. Why, why did we start to look at immersive media? Uh, well, we actually see several things going on, but let me pick out two of those developments. On the one hand, we see the need for increased realism through higher resolution, 3D video, larger screens, 4K, 8K is being thrown at us, uh, ultra high definition TV. And on the other hand, we see that people require more and more a personalized experience and uh, on all of their different devices, smartphones and tablets, they want to control themselves uh, through intuitive interfaces, what they want to see, where they want to see it. And if you only look at the end user devices, the growth of, uh, of, of not only the numbers, but also the diversity, uh, this is exploding as, uh, as we speak. And to give you an example of how true it is, uh, you only need to look at last year's uh, Olympic Games in London, uh, where the BBC actually did two very interesting trials. So on the one hand, together with the Japanese uh, broadcaster NHK, they did a series of public broadcasting of 8K uh, uh, video. So that's uh, 8K is about 16 times HD and 22.2 audio channels. And I think there were actually three setups in England where you could see these, uh, these setups. And what, what I really found interesting when they reported about this is that they didn't provide any commentary or infographics, nothing. It was just sitting there and watching this media come at you. So really nothing in the way of you experiencing uh, and immersing yourself in media. And on the other hand, they had a, another service, if you like, on personalized video streaming. So really on your mobile, really see uh, what you want uh, at the time you want to see it. So here you see those, uh, those two trends quite clearly. And that's actually where the, 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 uh, the work that, that, uh, that we present here originated. Uh, we thought, if we have these two trends, how do we support them at the same time? Um, and we thought, well, there are two things that you need to take care of. On the one hand, you need to make sure that you start producing format agnostically. So no longer producing for a specific format, be it mobile, SD, HD, or maybe even beyond HD. Uh, and you have to decide on the format when you are going to consume it or when you are going to deliver it. And on the other hand, uh, with these high resolutions on the one hand and these smaller screens on the other hand, you need to be able to interactively view uh, and navigate, for example, around high uh, resolution video panorama and, and, and make sure that the audio changes with that experience. And when we presented this uh, uh, last year at the NEM Summit, somebody said, so you basically want to record everything and then allow people to focus on one perspective. And I think he captured it quite accurately. So. What, what usage scenarios are we thinking of? Well, imagine that you have, for example, this image from the Chelsea uh, st uh, stadium. 
Uh, in this case, it's uh, captured with a resolution of about, it says seven, but let's say six K by two K uh, uh, pixels. And you would be able to zoom in to certain parts of, uh, of this video. You could consume it in a public space on large public screens, video walls like these, or uh, the one at Fraunhofer, where they have uh, a totally immersive media lab. But you would also be able to watch it on your mobile. So this use case obviously is not new, especially with this community. Uh, last year at the NOSTEF uh, workshop, there were several papers dealing with this particular use case as well. So I think what, what, what is interesting is that with this work, we try to co uh, accommodate for three device categories. On the one hand, the larger displays for public viewing um, with also multi-channel audio setups. Then on the second uh, part, we look at the home situation. So uh, smart TVs uh, with, with maybe some uh, interactive controllers, gesture based, and then mobile terminals, obviously. So the system that uh, that I'm presenting here basically has four, I would say, innovative aspects, and I will go over all of these four aspects. Uh, and I will start with, on the capture and acquisition side, how do we capture our audiovisual data? So let's start up left and then we go clockwise. Well, first of all, uh, we're not doing actual full audiovisual scene capture. That would mean that you would have to uh, uh, capture the full planoptic and planocoustic uh, functions, which is what you would do if you would go to, for example, like a holographic uh, projection. We're also not doing 3D or even free view video. We do 3D audio, but no 3D video. And uh, that was partly because uh, there was already a lot of 3D video projects going on. There's actually a very nice free view a uh, project uh, uh, called Fine that, that might be of interest. But we were really looking at today's production, which most of it still for TV is 2D. And a concept that, that we came up with uh, rather quickly is that you need to put some structure to the capture that you're going to do. And this structure is not really a format because it doesn't define everything that you are going to deliver, but it should allow you to come up with any rendering, view, or format that you want to do. And this is what we refer to as the layered scene representation. And it's basically information uh, on the spatial and temporal relation of all the sensors that you use in your capture, of all the audiovisual data. Uh, and it also relates all of those uh, uh, sensor uh, data. Uh, for example, you would say, I would have a camera cluster here and it relates to another camera cluster there, or I would have a set of microphones here and they're related somehow to, to uh, other microphones. Uh, so this means you need to have geometrical information uh, on the few different views of the scene. Uh, you need to have information on the audio objects that you're capturing. Uh, you will need to have information on all of the resolutions, frame rates, dynamic ranges of all the cameras that you're using. Uh, and all of that, that, that type of information needs to be captured in a, uh, in a model. And this, this is just the, let's say, uh, tree-based structure that we use. So you would have a scene, an audiovisual scene. It consists of video and audio, so no other sensors in this case could, could, op could, uh, could be. And if we start with a video scene, we say, well, we try to capture that video scene with a number of camera clusters. And each camera cluster is basically seen as a set of closely related cameras. Could be, for example, an omnidirectional camera, or it could be a set of broadcast cameras uh, that are located closely enough to have sort of the same uh, common view on that scene. Audio-wise, there are basically two type of uh, um, information that we want to capture. On the one hand, audio objects, and an audio object could be seen as something coming from a spot microphone, or it could be something that is derived from a larger audio field, for example, through beamforming or something. And the second part is sound field, and sound field is a different way of looking at how you capture audio, uh, because it doesn't say something about particular objects or directions, it just says something about the overlying sound pressure that you need to capture. And, and here you typically use microphone arrays, or you'd use so-called sound field microphones, and I have a number of them uh, to show. So let's start with visual sensors, and let's start directly with, for me, the most impressive one, uh, which is called the Omnicam. It's a camera which has been manufactured by uh, Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute. Uh, it contains six HD cameras in a very uh, impressive uh, setup with a mirror rig. Um, 
They also uh, integrated a real-time stitching engine so that you can actually stitch the video panorama uh, from those six cameras in real time. Uh, very impressive. Uh, it has nearly 180 degrees field of view, but what I think is really interesting, it has a single optical view. And if you look at most of the uh, omnidirectional or panoramic uh, camera systems, that is always a big problem is that you have multiple optical views on the scene. And this, because of this mirror rig, has just a view from the uh, position that you're shooting from, which is, I think is very uh, interesting. Uh, it started out with, let's say, regular broadcast cameras. But uh, when we got uh, Ari involved, the German uh, camera manufacturer, they allowed us to experiment with their Ari Alexa M camera, which is one of the most impressive uh, film cameras. Um, so this allowed us to do test shoots with four, uh, 50 frames per, per second, but also to capture high dynamic range images, because this camera has uh, no less than 14 stops, which really approaches the dynamic range of traditional cellular film. Um, so this would be our main sensor, and then we would have a number of additional standard HD broadcast cameras uh, that would be co-located with, within this camera cluster. So how about audio? I, I mentioned uh, sound field recording. Uh, you need sound field microphones for that. And uh, there are two that we use. One of them is the, the Eiger mic, uh, which is this uh, nice uh, Death Star-like uh, uh, sphere in the, in the middle. It allows you to capture basically a, a, a 3D audio field uh, using 32 capsules. And there's another sound field microphone. That one is much more common with uh, four capsules. And then, additionally, you have a bunch of single-source microphones, pop microphones, stereo microphones, the one that you would regularly use. Um, and on the right hand below, you see a football pitch. Uh, this is uh, basically the example that we took when we recorded uh, a football game, uh, Chelsea against Wolverton, where you see the position of all of those mics, so you see that the complete felt, uh, pitch is surrounded by a number of, let's say, single-source mics. Then we have two sound field uh, microphones on each of uh, uh, pit sides and then an Eiger mic actually closely located to the, uh, to the camera uh, sources or ca camera sensors. So what test shoots did we did? I, th I mentioned the football one, but that was actually already in 2010. Last year we did two test shoots and we first started out in May uh, by recording a, the, the famous uh, Carmen Suite by uh, Rodion uh, Schedrin. It was performed by a German dance company uh, together with the uh, Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, directed by Sir Simon Reddell. And apparently that, that is a big thing. I didn't know that, but they are quite big in the orchestra world. Um, as I've said, we had the Omnicam equipped with uh, Ari Alexas and we had uh, 3D sound acquisition. And let me just give you an example of how that looked like. And here I'm going to switch the audio. That's this one, I think. But let's take this one. So uh, let me. Are you okay? So what you see here, um, first of all, is a audio thingy. Um, this is the raw material coming out from the cameras, and you can already see, first of all, the different lines between the cameras, and that the color blending, the calibration, basically, was not perfect. Actually, it was very far from perfect. So there was quite a problem for this uh, stitching engine, um, because the calibration of the cameras before you do the recording is very, very important. And here, uh, in particular, one of the cameras, so it's this one, uh, there the calibration really went, uh, went, went wrong, and it's very hard to cover for that uh, afterwards. There is audio with this one, but never mind, it's not 3D anyway, so it's not that, uh, that important. So we actually experimented with putting the camera at different positions in this, in this large hallway um, uh, in order to see if, if the, the, the view on the scene uh, would make a difference uh, in relation to how, to, to how you would perceive the scene. So, in August last year, we actually managed to record the BBC prompts. That's the good thing if you have the BBC involved, you can uh, do these kind of things. So we went to Royal Albert Hall, and there we had uh, a very nice uh, a capture of the, uh, of the BBC prompts. And let me give you again an indication of how that looked like. Um, 
one difference with the previous setting is that there's not a lot happening here. Ah, I need to connect this one. Okay. There's not a lot happening in the scene other than the orchestra somewhere in the center. So it's fairly different visually from the previous recording. Audio-wise, this was maybe even more interesting. Um, but this, this setup is really interesting if you think about the application for, for example, video surveillance, because now you will be able to actually zoom in to the audience and try and recognize faces. So, with those test shoots done, this is the material that we're going to use in, our, in the rest of our system. Um, and the rest of the system after the capture starts with production automation. And why do we need production automation? Well, if we don't decide on the format when we capture, we need to decide on it afterwards. Um, and that could be directly after, let's say, the production, a sort of post-production uh, setting, or it could be further down the delivery chain. Um, but if you do decide on a format still, you need to consider that there might be different fewer groups, they might have different end devices, so it might be interesting to, to uh, decide on this, on this format, format in parallel for multiple uh, groups. And we need to automate that, because the people that were responsible for the capture don't no longer have influence on how you produce it. And this is where the production scripting engine comes in. That's a component that is capable of choosing the camera views, uh, based on a number of data, for example, automatic video analysis. And this allows you to do something which we call a virtual director. So there's no longer a real director, there is some component which decides uh, on what view is interesting uh, to the viewer. Uh, basically, it decides on Where's the action? How do we make the shot? And how do we move from one shot to the other? Uh, I do have to say that still we allow uh, a producer, a director to uh, intervene or to assist. So we have an editor tool which can uh, help the production scripting engine. And this editor tool is something like uh, uh, an interface that you would see in a uh, typical broadcast fan where somebody is still selecting all of the different views. So let's consider the workflow of this production scripting engine for a while, and by that I don't mean look at this whole architecture picture, but let's see what is really important here. There is a number of sensors. We have microphones, the Omnicam, other cameras. We have this editor-user uh, interface in the lower left end, and all of this goes to a content analysis stage. Uh, and out of this content analysis stage, information comes that is stored in the knowledge base, and all of this information is used by the scripting engine to basically decide on what you are going to see. Um, and in order to decide, you need to have some, some, some rule set, some rule engine. Well, there are, there, there's processing frameworks for this, for example, the, uh, uh, what is it called, the, the GBOL tools that, that, that you can use to implement these, uh, these set of rules. So, out of this content analysis comes, for example, feature tracking, uh, where are football players in this case. And based on that information, the scripting engine will tell the rendering engine, this is the view that might be of interest to you, or this is the view that you need to render. That's, that's basically how this component works. So in that sense, it's very simple. It's a, a model of how a director would operate. So, Something shortly about this content analysis part. Um, one of the things that, that has been implemented, mainly by uh, your name research, is a so-called region tracker. So it tracks interesting regions over the video, <coughs> over the, the different frames. It does so in parallel because it's uh, uh, completely unfeasible to do this for this full panoramic image. So it's be being separated in six HD tiles, and each of those tiles is being analyzed. Uh, actually, it's being analyzed by a number of, let's say, common uh, uh, trackers and detectors that we know of. We have the point tracker, I think it's a KLT uh, point tracker. We have the blob de detector, which is just existing in OpenCV. And we have a hawk person detector, which is also a very common uh, algorithm to detect uh, persons in a, uh, in a scene. Uh, some of them have been uh, uh, implemented using uh, CUDA architecture, so that it's near real time. Uh, but you have to add something else after this. You have to make sure that what you detect in one tile is consistent over the whole panorama. So there's something called a multi-tile tracker, which makes sure that over the whole panorama things are being made uh, consistent. Um, just some evaluation numbers of, of the performance of the system. There are separate papers on this uh, that are referred to in, in, in our work, where you can find much more on the detailed uh, implementations and the performance. 
I think there are two main aspects. It's quite precise. I mean, the precision uh, is high, recall rate is high, but it's not yet real time. And this is, this is something that is being worked on at the moment because we want to have it real time. So, time again for some video. First of all, let's see if this production scripting engine produces something that is useful. Uh, let's see. I guess it's quite obvious what has been detected here and what view is being generated. So, there was an interesting scene. I mean, you were following the ball, but still apparently it was useful to stay a bit longer uh, to look at the coaches, whether they were giving advice or something. In general, I would say here, you will see that the ball was being tracked and that is generating the view. You will also see a bit of camera smooth, uh, smoothing uh, to make it more natural. Uh, what, is, what is missing still, I guess, and what you would see in a regular sport broadcast is that you will see a lot of uh, wide shots and maybe some, some uh, spider cams flowing in and out. So this is, this is just basic steps here. Okay. Um, then let's look at tracking. So this is uh, outcomes of this uh, multi-tile tracking. Uh, you will see that although persons are being detected now and then they switch off. There are a lot of children running here, so so let's 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 see how that uh, works. And then um, I will skip this part for uh, for a moment. So that about production automation. Now, what about the network? If you look at the <laughs> bandwidth coming out from a typical camera cluster, it could lead up to. 24 gigabytes per second, gigabit per second, for let's say an Omnicam and two HD cams, regardless of the audio. So I'm neglecting audio here. Uh, so that's going to be quite a challenge, even if you do uh, compress, uh, which means that you have to do some other approaches uh, in order to cope with this data. Obviously, when high efficiency video coding is, is, is there, that will be very helpful. I mean, uh, ultra uh, high definition TV is something, is a use case that is, um, very important to HCVC. However, there's no real-time HCVC codec that we could use at this time. Also, it does not support yet all of the interactivity that we have in mind. And I say yet because there are some contributions uh, being made uh, in MPEG standardization, uh, in particular to this aspect. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, so how to do the actual coding? Work has been done on that. Uh, there has been work uh, done by uh, National University of Singapore presented here uh, last year and, and some other places. There have, has been work done by our colleagues from Alcatel, so we know a bit how to deal with the coding of this information. But I think what is, what is of interest is how we constructed our delivery network. And you see two tracks. And those two tracks, I think, are consistent with the today's networks world where you still will see managed delivery networks, so IPTV broadcast cable. Uh, but increasingly, you will see over-the-top video, internet-based, content delivery networks. So I think it, it, we, we made a good choice in trying to accommodate for both. And we did some further, let's say, distinguishment. Uh, we said for the managed world, we are focusing on some new delivery protocols, uh, as if you were able to really, from the, from the start, implement and, and design your managed network. However, for the unmanaged world, for the over-the-top world, we really want to focus on today's developments, which means adaptive streaming content delivery networks. So it's not only a split in network, it's also split in time, you would say. We have methods that could be applied easily right now over the internet, and we have methods that could be applied in sort of greenfield managed uh, delivery situations. There are three ma main components. We have an ingest, where we basically segment the content, not only in time, but mainly in space, so we do a spatial segmentation. We have an intermediate transport component, referred to as the relay. Uh, this is where we deal with the scalability. This is also where we deal with, let's say, transfer between different uh, transport methods. And lastly, we have a network ad site, and there you could do different things. You could just transmit the data to your, over your infinite bandwidth uh, setting through large uh, public displays. You could adapt uh, and filter out a bit of the content to make it suitable for, for, the, for the views that you are watching on your screen. Or you could do all of the rendering uh, based on interaction on the device, 
since that, that rendering cannot be done on the device itself. So there are a large number of possibilities there. Um, about content segmentation. Uh, in view of the time, I will just start with the example. So remember this layered scene. What we do, we take from the layered scene, we take each of the layers, for example, broadcast cam, omnicam, and for each of the layers, we create so-called skills. And skills are basically uh, uh, scaled down versions of, of each layer. And this is interesting because this is useful to zoom into content. For example, if you want to display this omnidirectional video on a tablet with a much lower resolution, you take the actual skill that fits with your screen. Uh, however, for, for scaled versions uh, that are still of higher resolution, you're going to tile them into a certain grid. And let me sh show you how that looks like. So this will be a layer. This will be another layer, for example, from broadcast camera. Then we have a scale of full resolution from this uh, omnidirectional video, and we have one on HD resolution. And then we start tiling, and that typically looks like this. And then for each of the tiles, you can still do something like different representations, different bit rates. And actually, if you start segmenting in time afterwards, then we're back to HTTP adaptive streaming, or actually an extended version of that. And I think in this area, we've seen uh, quite a bit of work on, on the how useful this could be in today's delivery networks. So actually, that, that, that is what we have been looking at mostly, uh, trying to uh, come up with an extension of adaptive streaming where we don't only do space or time segmentation, but also spatial segmentation in such a way that we can readily use this approach on today's CDN servers. And we did some experiments for with uh, a Dutch CDN provider, Jetstream. Uh, I think they're, they're quite large now in, uh, in Europe. And I think the idea is, is, is fairly uh, basic. So you have these different skills, you have the different tiles, uh, you have a segment client, either in the edge of your network or on the end device, and you combine those segments that you need in order to see the view that you have requested. And in one particular case, we, we added some second screen uh, control for, for display. But we had another feature where we could say, well, if you have additional content like this broadcast cam, it's not necessary to show that on the same screen. You can transmit that to your second screen as well. So here we also came up with some, some interesting event sig signaling uh, uh, ideas. We took another approach. And there we said, OK, let's start again from this uh, segmented content. And let's just see that we have different streams available. For example, we have the high resolution tiles, we have this low res full panorama. Experiments with that on how efficient uh, uh, did this. So, that was my rush <laughs> over delivery. In view of time, I'm now moving to uh, three topics uh, in one minute, apparently. <laughs> 3D audio. Um, this, is, this is a field by itself, obviously. What I think is interesting to note is that if you capture a sound field, there is a mathematical description uh, called higher uh, order ambisonics that allows you to capture the sound field very accurately. And it's basically a spatial Fourier transform using sound pressure components uh, and using the audio object information itself. And what is very interesting is that this description, this, this close captured formula, allows you to scale down the quality by reducing the orders of your formula. So if you don't want to use the full spatial resolution of your audio, you're just omitting some of the uh, uh, coefficients in your, in your higher order description. What is also very interesting is that it allows you to render the audio through arbitrary sets of speakers. Stereo, 5.1, 16 channel, wave field synthesis with 300 speakers. All of that is feasible. And that's that is, I think, where, where the interesting property of this, uh, this audio solution for format agnostic audio comes in. So this just is a picture of what I just said. So video rendering now is actually, I would say, uh, uh, readily done. It's an OpenGL video renderer, which has basically three rendering properties. First of all, it renders the view you are interested in. So camera view or pre-rendered views. Then it renders information, artificial information related to the scene. For example, information on views, on the speakers that are being, uh, uh, being tracked. And lastly, you always want to have some information that is not related to the actual view, like statistical information. It needs to stay in place if you move through the scene. Um, you see some, let's see, you see some uh, uh, highlighted areas. These are the views that have been rendered by this production scripting engine. 
you also see that uh, we have picture in picture here there. Not nothing special there, I guess. I have a video of this one which is related to the gesture-based interaction, uh, which I will show you uh, very shortly. Gesture-based interaction was just one of the approaches where we thought if you want to navigate, on the one hand you can do things like second screen, touch-based interaction, but with new systems like Kinect and hopefully you made a leap motion, you should be able to do gesture-based interaction. And then the interesting part is not so much that there is no body of work there. I mean, there's a lot has been done, but what are the useful gestures? What will work in this particular setting? Uh, it has to be easy to learn. It has to be work in real time. It has to, uh, it, it cannot have a learning phase. It should work automatically. So let me just show you, and this is actually the one video I managed to put in the presentation. Control the player. Volume down. And volume up. Mute and unmute with the same gesture. And finally, you can also pause and resume the player with this gesture. So, there's one signal not being shown, that is how you navigate. For example, zoom in, that's this. So you're swinging through the content. Quite, uh, quite interactive, I would say. So, nearly done because how do you evaluate this system, how do you compare it? I mean, all of the components have been evaluated, their performance compared to state-of-the-art. Here we just say, it works. Actually, it only works offline right now. Um, we have offline uh, uh, systems for all, uh, all of the components, file-based, so we have the captured recordings, uh, we have connected them over delivery networks, we have connected them to this production scripting engine, all of that works. There's one case where we have actually a live connection, that's from the Omnicam over a infiniband uh, network, so that this, I think, f allows for 40 gigabits per second. Um, TCP IP delivery of the uncompressed video to the rendering. And then, well, stay tuned for more after May 30, because then we will have our final public demonstration, uh, where we will show three things. We will show the live layered scene, representation capture, so Omnicam, all of the broadcast cams, all of the audio cameras connected to a full audiovisual setup, rendering, 16-channel uh, and bisonics format with gesture interaction. We have the live panoramic video delivery, so over the two delivery networks that I sketched, so to accommodate for a whole variety of devices. And lastly, we have this live content analysis and uh, production scripting engine-based view rendering. Some challenges ahead, obviously. The main one for me, synchronization of all of this. Uh, even if we have separated, let's say, our big system into three things, synchronization is going to be an issue. Logistics and artistic cooperation. You need to find some setting where people allow you to say, could you do that again because we did not capture it? That's going to be a challenge. So I think that's all I had to say. Thanks for your attention. Uh, and thanks to a lot of other people for their cooperation in here. Uh, a lot of this is also on the web, on our website, on our Vimeo channel. Uh, and I just want to point you to a, a workshop that is uh, coming up uh, next to the Euro ITV interactive content consumption. Might be of interest uh, to some of you. So, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Omar, for this so interesting talk. I, I start to wonder how can you put so much information in a paper. I wondered that myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because of time limit, just one question. Is there any? <laughs> No? Okay. Uh, okay. How big is the video? So, so in resolution-wise, the, the question is how big is the video? And uh, yeah. when I just look at this, what is coming out of this Omnicam, it's basically six times HD, so six times three gigabits per second, 18 gigabits per second, and the resolution is nearly 6K by 2K. So if you add additional cameras, it goes to, well, one HD camera, again, three gigabits per second. Uh, if you start adding HDR images, high dynamic range, then it explodes. So if we compress that, and we did that, for example, intra-only compression from the camera towards the ingest, it's, I would say, a couple of hundred megabits per second, uh, between two and 400, depending on the quality loss that you accept at the ingest side. So if you go to the delivery side, for example, what we use for tiled uh, adaptive streaming, we use, uh, I would say, uh, four to 
12 megabits per second depending on how many tiles you need to construct the view. I have some more papers on those parameters and details for you if, uh, if you're interested. Okay, thanks again for Omar. <laughs>